Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank. And uh, today we're going to be talking about The Expanse, episode 506, Tribes, which was written by my good friend, Hallie Lambert, and directed by uh, the totally adequate Jeff Wilno. <laughs> <laughs> Hallie's my good friend, too. You don't have to just say that she's your good friend and not mention that she's my good friend. Cause really? Because that's not the way Hallie talks about you. <laughs> Hallie's in, uh, one of our success stories because she uh, in the first season she was uh, she was our PA in the first season and Noreen Shankar our showrunner's uh, personal assistant and over the course of six or five seasons she went from that to uh, a staff writer and then a story editor wrote a couple of scripts for us so yeah she she came up through the ranks man yeah next season she'll be running Alcon <laughs> and then she be already running. is. <laughs> I really enjoyed this episode, and I love it starting off with Bobby kicking a little ass. Yeah, they were trying to board the the Razorback, and uh, and seeing Alex do some heroic stuff, jumping from the Razorback uh, or from the the ship, and then back to the Razorback. That was pretty. Yeah, those were those were a couple of our biggest uh, set pieces of the season. You know, huge practical sets that we were using for some of that stuff. Um, obviously a lot of visual effects, a lot of wire work. It was a, it was a big sequence to shoot. It took a, it took a fair amount of time. And then we have, uh, Sheree being asked to be, uh, back in the cabinet position, back in the place of power. And she, uh, she straps on her jewels, puts back on her armor, getting ready to go back to work. Yeah. Yeah, Well, that's, uh, that's her version of power armor, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's her, that's her, like, it's time to get back into it. Yeah. And, uh, and this episode, I mean, there's a lot going on in this episode. I mean, this is this is Clarissa and Amos trying to survive uh, in the in the fallout of the recent attacks, trying to cross this devastated stretch of country to get back to uh, to get back to where somebody can help them. Um, yeah, there's a there, and, and you know we've got a we've got Kara and uh, her gang going to meet with Marco. So there's a lot going on. Oh, and Marco. and of course the Rasanante. Uh, now that the uh, explosion code has been stripped out. Um, getting ready to go on a hunt. Yeah. You know, watching this episode and, and uh, it, it brings back PTSD of actually shooting these scenes of being up <laughs> in the north of the wall in the frozen tundra <laughs> out in the yeah, snow. It was, it was cold out there, man. It was cold. It was really cold. Um, but uh, it just, I'm so thankful with the way it turned out and how it looked and it just looks spectacular. It was, uh, yeah, yeah. Our our locations department and uh, and the people who uh, help us create those those areas they did a great job. I mean, they found us some really interesting locations and some of the shots uh, of just you and and uh, and um, I keep wanting to I keep wanting to say Clarissa, but you and Nadine walking through the trees. Yeah, some of those are just beautiful. Uh, Jeff shot some beautiful, beautiful shots. Well, it's Clarissa too. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't be wrong by saying Clarissa. She, she has a real. She she actually has a real name. <laughs> All right, we got two special guests coming on tonight to talk about five oh six. Ty, would you like to introduce them? Yeah, well, there's there's the awesome Kara G, who is. Uh, I'm glad she made it here because she just had a baby, so it's hard for her to uh, to do anything uh, right now. But I'm um, glad she made time for us. And then the you know okay Keon Alexander. <laughs> And I don't think he just had a baby, so he's cool. But I'm really excited to talk to both of them. I think they did such a great job this season, did phenomenal work. And, uh, and, and you know, Kara's work's a little different than we've seen in the past. Yeah, uh, we, we're definitely seeing a different side of Drummer this season. I mean, she's still fierce. Uh-huh. She's still not an enemy you would ever want to have. Uh-huh. Um, but we're going to see a, you know, sort of a, a vulnerable side to her, a tender side to her, the, the side of her that she shows to her family. And, and that really lets, you know, that's really letting Kara sort of stretch her, her performance wings, her acting wings. And yeah, I mean, she's got a, she's got a lot of range to her. So, um, she's taken every challenge and just run with it. All right, Kara, Keon, welcome to the show. Uh, we're discussing, uh, 506, but we're also going to talk about your journey with the expanse and, and Kara, how long have you been, uh, so far, this is your fourth season, fifth season. I joined in season two. Oh, so OG been here since the beginning. Well, <laughs> I kept calling I- it season one though. I was like, no, God damn. There's a whole season before I showed up. <laughs> well, it really got started when you got there. That's the thing. <laughs> 
But uh, Ty, we were, ac- we were actually talking earlier about um, your arc this season. And I think, you know, you, Drummer's been kicking ass for so long. And I think a character can only do that when, it's, when you start and you start to need to see other dimensions. You start to see the human side of her and how it ticks. Was this something that you worked with the writers or before? Because, you know, Drummer is one of the, the few characters that was in the books, but kind of is being created originally. And so is it a, 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 the process of creating this season in this arc, how did this happen? Well, I, I mean, I, 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 the writers did their thing, right? Like I, <laughs> that wasn't really, I didn't, I wasn't weighing in on that. That's for sure. I was um, just as thrilled to receive those scripts and be like, oh, damn, this is where we're going this year. Good, good, good. Um, of course, I had read the books. So I, I knew that we were going to be doing the, the Polyam Belter fam. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so I was, you know, I was aware that we were headed in that direction. Um, but yeah, I feel like I've just been, I've been absorbing different characters from the novels. So I just like have been sort of picking and choosing as we go the the pieces of them that I'm trying to, you know, Frankenstein together and, and make it work as best I can. That's, and Ty, that's- what if you, what is that process like in, in terms of how you're creating drummer? because it's the one character that is kind of an amalgamation of other characters and specifically this season to set up the arc that she has. Yeah. It's uh, so (laughs) honestly it began because we needed somebody for Fred Johnson to talk to. And we had this character from the later books named drummer who, who worked, you know, with the belters and we're like, Oh, we'll just pull that character forward. And then someone will be on Tycho and Fred can talk to that person. And uh, we didn't, you know, that was it. That was pretty much the only reason Drummer got brought in is just, just for that. And then Kara was so good and had such presence in that first season she was in that we just kept giving her more stuff to do. We kept going, well, what if she was also this person? Well, what if she was also there? And, you know, by now, obviously, she's like half the people in the expanse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she just, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to embarrass her. She's sitting right there, but, but, uh, that's really what happened is just every time we gave her something to do, she just did it so well that we were like, Hey, we have this new thing that needs to happen. Who will we give that to? Well, Kara, cause we know she could do it. And, and in many ways, she sort of became our stand in for the entire belt, you know, because she's, she's got a, she's got all of the different viewpoints. She's, she's very pro belt. She's very patriotic at the same time. She's very conflicted about what the free Navy is doing. She doesn't think they should be killing the inner planets people at the same time, she understands that a huge part of how the belt survives is picking the scraps off of the inner planets. So she's got a lot of conflicting emotions about what's going on in the world. And so yeah. it just becomes an interesting character for all those reasons. And it put all of us on notice. I mean, we were like, if we don't do a good job next season, cares going to be playing our part. <laughs> so just beyond the Rossi, <laughs> people will be calling her Amos. <laughs> All of a sudden, she's just in her underwear on Earth, in the winter. <laughs> in the snow. <laughs> Keon, how did uh, how did this role come to you? How did you hear about it for the first time? Um, I believe it was first listed on Craigslist when I came across it. <laughs> um, I was really excited at the opportunity. They they were weren't paying much at the time, but you know, I was just going through Craigslist looking for gigs. You know. Uh-huh. That's, That's how, how we get almost all of our actors. <laughs> Shout out to Craigslist. <laughs> Did you um, you know, about that? The dude who created Craigslist is a huge fan of the show. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Shout out Craigslist. What yeah. up? Is his name um, Craig? Yeah, his name is actually Craig. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> we wouldn't have got Keon you, if it wasn't for you. Well, you know, I, I was actually there at dinner in LA with uh, Kara, who's a longtime friend of mine and Dom the night that you guys found out that the show was canceled. And so my connection goes back to that very night when I was sort of consoling Dom and we were, we were all talking about it. And I didn't know this. Yeah. We were all together that night and it was, it was a little somber. I mean, we were having a pretty good dinner and then, and then the call came in and Dom broke the news and, and uh, we were actually on our way to go see a, see a show so we walked over and on the way i'm sort of consoling her and it was the first time we had met and 
the next time we saw each other was when the show was revived and we were sitting next <laughs> to each other in the in the makeup chair playing lovers ex-lovers and having had a child together and it was so the connection goes back to Kara and then weaves through Dom and then here I am uh with you guys playing your your uh your favorite belter this is a great story I didn't know that did you know were you and Kara friends before yeah we were friends for for a long time before that um and so I was familiar with the show I was familiar with the books I thought it was dope I'm a big fan of of uh of the books and uh and so i was familiar with with marco too so when it when it uh came my way it was it it was like a big nuclear possibility and so the second second that it came my way on craigslist i just dove dove right in because there's so much material uh, in the in the books, there's there's the the painting that's painted is so rich about his his psyche uh, that I uh, I dove dove right in and I, I haven't come up come out of that for a while now. I I, uh, I enjoy playing in his in his psyche. Since you bring that up, I I'm curious about your process. I mean, as an actor, you would never judge your character, but you do something pretty terrible. I mean, you're killing millions of people. What did, what did you do in your backstory? What, what, I, you know, I, I don't know much about Marco's backstory, but how, what story did you create in order to justify those actions to do something that drastic and involve your son in it? I mean, I, in order to do a, a character like this justice, I think that you really have to start from the inner core of the being um, inner, inner core, pre-trauma, you know, and, and then go through those layers of, of what happens to create the, the grievances and the needs that become stronger and stronger. Like I, I really like to go back as early as possible because it, something that turns out to be so grotesquely violent as this, I think starts out at first with a whimper, and then becomes maybe a cry and then, and then, and then becomes maybe a, a punch. And then the punch becomes um, the, the willingness to hurt. And then from there, it just builds. And so there's, you can always find the precedence and the, the initial ripples that sort of butterfly effect out if you're willing to go far enough. And the thing is, a lot of the time we're really not with other human beings, are we? We're, we're, we take, the person at face value for the way they're behaving now. And we, we don't give them the time or the, um, the care to actually see why they're doing what they're doing. And so uh, to, to play him as multidimensionally as possibly, possible, you, I've ha really had to go deep to his core. I love hearing you say all that. I, I, I hate one dimensional, you know, villain characters who, who just, you know, evil for evil's sake. I think, one of the things that really speaks to the audience, because I, you know, I see people talking about it, is while they find what Marco has done horrifying, you, you see people all the time going, well, you know, he's not wrong. You know, he's, he's, uh, yeah. the arguments he's making are actual valid arguments. And, and I think the thing that, that we have to be able to sell is, is not that Marco would choose to do those things, but that he would be able to rally thousands of other people to the cause to to do those things with him. That's what we have to believe. And I think when we, when we listen to Marco speak and you hear the pain in his voice and you hear the rage in his voice, you understand why people like Sin and Coral and Philip and all these other people have been drawn to his cause. Yeah. My, my, my sense delving into him is that there are deep, deep desires that have been thwarted at every corner. And there's a, there's a psyche that, you know, it's a, it's a combination of the hurts and the traumas and also the, the needs. Like there is, there, there's the need for, uh, for attention and, and, and all that stuff, but inherently violent. No, I really, I really don't think so. I think it's the accumulation of blows. And I think it, there's, there's a lot of um, 
there's, there's the vision for the belt that he really truly believes is possible. So I think it's actually a product of optimism, strangely. It's a product of, of uh, believing that it is possible for there to be justice for belters that leads him to be willing to consider those means. I really don't think he's inherently violent. It's interesting because, you know, the people that are actually following you are, you know, the, these are people that, I mean, even Naomi in, in the beginning believed in your vision. You, you, were, you were making these people believe in themselves and believe in their vision and what could be possible. And these are good people, sin, that are, that are following you and getting behind you. And, you know, what I think is interesting is the question that Drummer has in 506, where she has to make the decision if she is going to, if she's going to follow you. And in the beginning, we see Drummer aligned with Fred Johnson, and we see her with Ashford. And these are all people that she respects, but there's, but she sees through, through Marco in a lot of ways. So what, uh, Kara, what did you, what went into that decision to, to actually, to work with Marco? Well, I think she's trapped. Um, Stephen Tracy, who plays Bertolt, he has that, you know, that fabulous speech about, um, about it, you know, Marco is presenting it as if it's a choice, but it's not a choice. Either we work with him or we die. And I think that is accurate. Um, so, so she's sort of, you know, she's, she's backed into to making that decision, if you could call it a decision. Um, not that she doesn't, uh, feel for some of what he's doing as well. Like, I think he does, you know, he does represent obviously one extreme uh, end of what, what the Free Navy or the OPA is doing and fighting for. And I think there are times where she's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, he's making a good point. But also at the same time, she cannot roll her eyes hard enough at him. Like she sees through that, like, <laughs> pompous i'm so glad i'm so 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 glad that uh in the edit um that they kept that eye roll you know that she's just like oh you might know him from a little project called the ganymede done she's like <laughs> Fuck off right and she has that line in season four where she's like he talks too much right and i think that that like she just sees through that um that, that was a great that. that's a great scene that you guys had in that moment where you're you're going back and forth and then yeah, Marco sees, God damn it, I like her. I like the way that she sees through me, that she doesn't, she's not an all of me like everybody else. And there's a respect level there. And then also the great scene is you see Naomi's son for the first time and you recognize him and, and that, that was played so well. Well, Cody, I mean, you see him and it's like, holy fuck, like, could they have found a more perfect actor for that role? Like you see him and it's like, <laughs> yeah, Dom's, and Keon had a, a baby of several years ago. <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, it's a trip. But that scene yeah. between Keon and I, that when you were talking about Wes, that was the very, very last um, day of shooting uh, for me for season five. Keon, do you remember that scene? You remember doing oh, that? I remember that scene. <laughs> I remember that scene. We think of Kara G as a woman of integrity and a, and a <laughs> wonderful actress who uh, is dedicated to her craft. But little do we know, little does the public know that she plays dirty. I do. It's so dirty. <laughs> I have to tell this story, Carrie. You tell can it. tackle me later. Tell it. But we're so we're setting this up. And and Wes, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of similarities between these two. Uh -huh. These there's there's a lot. The 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 difference uh, is what we're willing to do in order to achieve it. Uh -huh. Like the 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 chemistry is real because there's so much that is in common and it is aligned in terms of vision. Um, so we've been looking forward to this face off for a long, long, long time. I mean, we're friends, but also these two coming together to have a face off. Like we'd, we'd been, we'd been amped about this for a long time. So we get there and, uh, and, uh, Kara's a little pregnant. We, we, they did a good job of hiding it, but like eight months get, or something at that point. It was a yeah. lot. Okay, I, I yeah. can't believe I watch it and I'm like, where's her baby? What did it, like, where did it go? Cause she was pregnant through the whole thing. Very pregnant. Right? Yeah. They just, they just patted me a bit so that we looked pretty similar. If you've noticed, <laughs> yeah. I have a, I have a little bit of a baby bump, but anyway, so we get to that, we get to that face off point and we're both pretty focused when we're on one set most of the time. And then we're 
goofs the rest of the time. But we get there, we're shooting the face off, we're inching closer, we're inching closer. And I, I don't know if you can find the moment, we're gonna have to go back and look for the moment, but I'm sort of like convincing her. And as a ploy, Kara G, the wonderful Kara G, in the middle of me convincing her, giving my passionate, charismatic as fuck speech, chooses to bump me with her baby bump in the middle of the scene as a ploy. And, and, and I sort of, I don't know if you, it, we, we catch it in that take, but I sort of, and I mean, we're close friends. I love that baby from the moment I found out about it. She knows that I'll feel affected by the fact that I'm getting touched by this baby and it'll melt my heart. And in that moment, I think there's a glimmer in my eyes where you can see, I'm like, I can't believe you fucking did that. <laughs> you used the baby against me. And he's like, fuck you, boom. <laughs> <laughs> so dirty. Good. So that's my story. She plays dirty. That Wait, was that, was that your, dirty. Uh, that, I know it was your last scene, but was that also your first scene? together Shoot. no 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 because no uh, yeah season four yeah, you, cho you chose not to kill him fucked it there's a lot packed into that scene it's a it's totally. a pretty it's a pretty dense scene um really laying out who marco is how drummer's gonna have to interact with him why she's eventually gonna make the choices she makes later in the season um i mean there's a there's a lot of track that had to be laid in a fairly short amount of time there and yeah. and so much humor in it as well, which is the joy of this show is is getting to start a scene like that with uh you know saying no throne, no <laughs> no throne in your big yeah, like yeah. what a dream to get to. He sort says of, the war I won, and you're like, oh, did you you won? I we didn't. Did yeah. you win that? <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. Drummer's a little sassy. She's a little sardonic. Yeah, super. She is. She is. Yeah. And then Marco gets challenged in a major way by Sin in 506. And, you know, I think because it opens up and you're, you're pissed off that Naomi ruined the whole the whole perfect plan of the Rossi and that whole thing, how it's set up and what's going to happen. And then you're just you're just trying to, to wage a war here and everybody's undermining you every chance you get. You got your son <laughs> running around and and letting and letting the uh, Naomi know and then she, Naomi lets the Rossi know. And then you got Sin challenging you on the flight deck in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a shit show. And the biggest thing is that he didn't want Naomi there And the story as we're playing it out. This was a surprise. Philip decided on his own, like this is the, the problem of being a single father with a, with a teenage son. He's all of a sudden coming into his own and he's taking, taking uh, uh, actions without my, my per permission as a father. And so her showing up at that moment where the stakes are the, the highest, 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 and her being his kryptonite, her being even more than drummer, the one that can really see him, that his his dance doesn't work on, his his charisma does not manipulate. For for him to feel so naked in front of her and for her to be there in that moment is like nightmare, nightmare for sure. And so that that creates ripples. I mean, the, the fact that that uh, that Philip is not agreeing with him in moments where he's testing him is a ripple of that. I think I think sin. Um, being willing to get a little aggressive, which Philip says, I've never seen you two like that before. It has happened, but not in, in, in front of Philip or in recent times because Marco has now taken the throne, right? So it's all, it's all ripples of, uh, of something being done, Naomi coming against his will. And it's, it's just a, you know, it's a shit show. It's good. It's, it's throwing a lot at him in the most important moment of his life. I will Sorry. say that, that how wonderful is Brent Sexton? Oh. Yeah. I yeah. mean, just, good. just a wonderful, wonderful actor because I, very few people that I've, I've worked with, I can see go from lovable mama teddy bear, like he does with Naomi and like he does with yeah. Philip to this guy would literally rip me limb from limb. Like you see yeah. that steel in his eye when he faces down Marco. You see, oh, this is a guy, this is a brawler. This is this is a scary, scary man. Um, yeah. he, he he can do both ends of that spectrum, and he slides from one to the other. It's so graceful. And there's such yeah. a history 
that you guys have in your relationship that's on screen, you don't need to talk about it. You don't, you, the history lives amongst you two. And it, and it seems as if there was a role reversal that maybe he was the alpha when you were younger and then things changed and then he decided to rally behind you, but he had to swallow a little bit of pride and every now and then that thing rears its head. Yeah, and brother. I mean, we don't get a chance to really go into all that, but that's all layered in there. And I, uh -huh. I'm, I mean, Ty, I was super grateful that, that, that we got Brent because like Wes is saying, we didn't have to talk about any of that. We just both dropped into that history together. And yeah, Wes, he used to be Marco's mentor. He taught him a lot of stuff. And so when Marco rose up, there's, it's like surpassing the, uh, the, the, the sorcerer's apprentice, surpassing the, the, the sorcerer and come and becoming the leader. And so he's, there's a lot pent up there that leads to that moment of, of explosion. And it's really the fact that it's Naomi, who we both love very deeply, that that leads to that because he would never otherwise challenge me in that way. And what's interesting is how Marco. So if if Naomi was never brought aboard the ship and seeing how things would have played out or implemented itself, it would have been a lot different story than what's happening now. So instead totally. of how he adapts to the situation, even though there's this, you know, Naomi's there and his hands are tied in a way because he can't play too far one way or the other because you got sin and then he's got his son and he has to convince his son that Naomi's not on his side as opposed to like just by force, you know, so he knows how to apply force, but he also knows how to dance around like water, you know, and kind of go around mm. the problems and underneath the problems. And so I think dramatically it's so, it's so interesting to watch because here's a guy that's just trying to have his war and there's all these obstacles being put and, and he's handling it in a way that's unique to Marco. Whereas if, you know, with like a, a character like Drummer, it's, it's what you see is what you get. It's, it's you know, it's I, she will fucking hammer through it. You know, I mean, she I love how she took your gun away in 506. Uh, she's like, you know what? Why don't you give me that gun? Because <laughs> you know, I know you and I know how fired you up you are. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that I love about Drummer. I mean, Drummer is one of my favorite characters. And when. Uh, that scene when um, I don't remember, I think it was season three when she's shot in the gut and then she gets up and just puts a bullet in everybody's head when she's walking yeah. down, like casually do that, whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, what's funny is like when we see drummer tested or when we see something provoke her, her, you know, anger, us as an audience, we automatically look toward, <laughs> toward her gun. And so it's such a great <laughs> moment. It was such a great moment where she's like, uh, give me your gun. <laughs> you know, she took it from you. So uh, when we when we did the the fourth episode of the of this show, the after show, one of the things we didn't talk about, because I really wanted to talk about it when we had you on, is the death of Fred Johnson. Uh, in in the last episode, in episode five, uh, Grummer finds out about Fred's death. Yeah. And we see that it affects her deeply. You know, uh, one of her crewmates says, I hear he was a good man for an earther. And she says he was a good man, period. Um, and, and I really feel like um, even though Drummer left Fred on Tycho, didn't, didn't agree with the decisions he was making, didn't agree with the direction he was going. I still feel like there was a lot of deep affection there because it's so clear on her face how painful it is for her to hear that Marco has had him killed. And I really feel like in six, the episode we're talking about, all of that is with her. I mean, I think that's part of the reason Oksana takes her gun away. It's like if Drummer's facing the guy who ordered Fred Johnson killed, she's probably just going to pull her gun and shoot him. Um, you know, and consequences be damned. Uh, I, I really feel like. Uh, but also Ashford as well. Right? And Ashford as well. Yeah. Yeah, so she, like, yeah. how many how many of her friends have been killed by Marco now? Like, fuck that guy. Like, so many. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, and it's Corral who takes it. It's Corral who takes the gun when I come yeah. to the pulling her. Everybody's taking everybody's taking drummer's gun away. <laughs> but uh, no, I think that I think yeah, I think she has a, a good deal of affection for Fred Johnson still. I think I mean you see that in that episode actually, Wes, that you referenced where she pops those two guys when when she's shot. He like holds her so tenderly um and and cares deeply for her i think there's to find out that he's died and, and because of fucking marco you know fred fred and ash hi fred and ashford both i mean she says earlier she says you know all the optimists i know are dead and it's just trauma after trauma after trauma and i think i imagine that she has 
she has seen that so many times over and it's just building to this complete and total breaking point where it's I, I have this feeling about drummer in this season where it's almost like she gets to a point where she feels like she's she's already dead almost like she's well, you know that's the that's the classic uh you know japanese samurai version is is you know to be a warrior you have to you have to go into battle picturing yourself already dead so that you have no fear um mm -hmm. And and the 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 choices that that drummer makes later in the season, obviously we won't spoil those, but but the choices she makes later in the season really reflects that. I think um, I, I think I think you've done such a nice job of of portraying that buildup that when we get to those moments later, they're going to feel so organic. They're just going to feel like the thing that happens because of what she's been through and, and you see that slow build in her exactly what you're talking about. Well, I thank you. And I think that giving her a family this year too deepens that sense, right? Like, like we she, she feels when we meet drummer, she feels so s stone cold and alone really in a lot of ways she's with Fred, but she's, um, you know, and then we see her warm up to Ashford and develop that, um, you know, that companionship that they have together. That's quite tender and sweet and, and then he's ripped away from her and Fred's ripped away and she has this family. And we are seeing that, you know, one of her, one of the, the greatest risks that she takes this season is loving and being loved. You know, that's so foreign and such a huge risk because everyone she loves is, you know, ripped away from her. So I think that having that, 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 that polyamorous family heightens that sense of her dying inside as things go on. We've, you know, we've talked a bit in this show about, uh, even before you guys came on, about Brent and Olenike on, you know, in Marco's crew and, and, uh, and Jasai and sort of the family we've built around, around Marco. Can you talk a little, we haven't talked talk much about Drummer's family. Can you talk a little bit about working with those guys? I would love to. Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> I do feel like there's something that happens on this show and it is a little bit magical, not unlike my dear friend Keon having been with us the night we got canceled and then all of a sudden he's my you know, arch nemesis on the show. I think the casting of the people who, who are playing my family, there's something magical that has happened there. Um, Steven, Tracy, uh, Samer Salem, Vanessa Smythe, Willix Lee, and Sandrine Holt just we bonded. And I, I, that doesn't always happen. It's an extremely, extremely lucky thing. Um, so I do think that, that, you know, because of that, that time we were spending together, um, you know, away from set and the investment that we all have in the show, I hope that that comes through in that chemistry. And it was really important to all of us um, that this queer polyamorous family is represented well. I think it's such a rare thing to see um, queer relationships of any sort still, it's still quite rare to see that represented. Um, and, and to see something so fluid and polyamorous represented, we wanted to treat that with respect. Uh, and, and I know that certainly the, the writing reinforces that um, and not just have it be like, you know, I don't know, superficial or it, it was very important that there was love at the center of it. Um, and I think that, that we, we all worked really hard to achieve that and, and had a lot of fun. Well, it certainly worked. I mean, I think the, the relationship and the love that you guys have for each other is the trigger for vulnerability. I always say, um, as, you know, when you make it to an adult, you figure out how to protect yourself. You know what you're sensitive about, you know how to maneuver and everything. And then you have kids and it starts all over again. God damn it. You know, you're, you're beating hard is outside of your body. And you're like, shit, I'm vulnerable all over again. And I think the only way that we could get to where we got to with Drummer is creating a family that she truly loved and that they truly loved her. Because the reason that that decision to decide to side with Marco or not side with Marco is so interesting is Drummer's already done the math. She knows that she doesn't, I mean, I'm, I'm just speaking, yeah. but no, it's not, this is not somebody that she necessarily wants to align herself with but she has to take care of her family and what is the best thing for them and, and, and going forward and, and what they want. And so, you know, having these new relationships 
and this new family is showing us a side of drummer that's so interesting and so vulnerable and so different than what we've seen before. And it's such a smart device. I'm glad I thought of it in the writer's room. <laughs> That family. We're very grateful yeah. to Wes for coming yeah. up with all our best ideas. <laughs> I never get credit, but you know, Kara and Keon, thank you for joining us. That was so great to talk to you guys about the expanse in 506. And uh, Tad, do you want to say anything before we leave? No, I'm really grateful to have these two guys on here. Um, you guys are great interviews. Great interviews, great actors. Uh, I, I'm so excited about this season. It's, it's my favorite season so far. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Please, if you get a chance to like and subscribe down there and uh, tune in next episode, we talk about 507. 